Officer number 1763 at Mount Vernon, uh, DCTV, Golf Oil, Danny Chinchillo and uh, New Rochelle Golf never go there. Uh, street Cleaner, New Rochelle Cops, uh, Aurora Kelly, uh, Bruiser Ken, uh, Refile Omnibus 3, Refile Omnibus 4. Uh, Gregory uh, Godfrey South and his son Mark, Cheater Landlords, uh, Omnibus 5 and Omnibus 6. And every week I go through each one of these and add to it the number of hours for that week. Here's an example. Now uh, this is court officer number 1763, 349 hours, $1,775. Uh, the cum for that week, or the omnibus for that week, was 3 hours and $11. And this is uh, omnibus 6. We'll also add in the defendants, MCI and Camp Bell Express. The complaint is, is uh, well on its way to being completed. Here's the $255 money order sent to that crazy MCI world com. And they're still as bad as they were Monday. Call them again today. They're not even going to turn on the service. See, they made the mistake. They sent the bill to the wrong address. I never got the bill. How can you pay a bill if you never get it? I told them what address to send it to, box 416, and they sent it to the wrong address. So I never got it. But they'll never do that again, because I've had that address changed. All mail will stop and go to box 416. Anyhow, they say, it takes them six to seven days to post it, the bill that they that has been paid, and then it takes them 72 hours after that to turn it on. Do not use MCI WorldCom. I have always favored MCI because it was McGowan who gave his life to break the ATT monopoly, and I have great respect for that. But the way the company has turned in after its merger with WorldCom is pitiful. Do not use MCI. Don't use AT&T. Find somebody else. These are words, these words are so interesting. I love the English language and how beautifully it conveys what you're thinking. Let me find you some words. This is Webster's Collegiate, G.C. Miriam. We used to go out with a fellow who became president of G.C. Miriam at Classical High School in Springfield. Crawford Lincoln. Okay, admire. Did you know that admire means this? To regard with wondering esteem, accompanied by pleasure and delight. To look at or upon with an elevated feeling of pleasure. Aren't they good? Exactly what you do when you admire something. Admissible, worthy of being admitted. Admit, to suffer to enter, to grant entrance to, whether into a place, the mind, or consideration, as to admit a friend into one's confidence. Don't they do a great job? Admonish. To warn of a fault. To reprove gently or kindly, but seriously. To exhort. Reprove is a synonym. 
uh, ad nauseum, to nausea, bring something up to the point of being nauseous. Adonis, a beautiful youth loved by Aphrodite. In youth he was slain by a wild boar. So great was Aphrodite's grief that the gods required Adonis to spend only part of the year in Hades. <laughs> this is a chat with Glendora, and it's Saturday, and it's uh, 6 p.m., and it's beautiful weather. And we thank you, God, for all of the great things that you give us in this beautiful world. And why did those murderers do that? God is as displeased as anybody. Maria told me about her cousin who worked in an office on the 104th floor of the World Trade Center, the second building to be attacked. And she, when the first building was attacked, she said to her boss, let's get out of here. And her boss says, I have a couple of phone calls to make. And she ran. She got down to the 61st floor, and her building was attacked. She made it. Her boss did not. Two thousand one. Church time again, and people can't even find a place to park. Isn't that nice? And it looks like we're in the tent. Oh, I thought we were all through with the tent. But that's where people are going. It's beautiful weather this year. Beautiful weather. Ike says that the condominiums down the road from us, that they allow pets, cats and dogs. So I'm going down there. Or that. Our worship with a psalm that I have found especially poignant in these days as the earth is trembled, but yet our God is still a very present help in time of trouble. folks. Quaropus, White Plains. You see the sun is lifting the moisture off of the grass in the field early in the morning.
Rusty slept in a house last night, and he was warm. How are we going to celebrate Glendora's 50 years on television? It started in September of the year 1951. And here it is 50 years later, in September in the year 2001. I suppose we could do a history of it. It started at NBC Hollywood, Sunset and Time, in September of the year 2001. Well, let's think about it. We could eat. We could drink soda pop. We could have a party. We could have a special. Ad nauseum. To nausea. Bring something up to the point of being nauseous. Adonis, a beautiful youth loved by Aphrodite. In youth he was slain by a wild boar. So great was Aphrodite's grief that the gods required Adonis to spend only part of the year in Hades. <laughs> this is a chat with Glendor, and it's Saturday, and it's uh, 6 p.m., and it's beautiful weather. And we thank you, God, for all of the great things that you give us in this beautiful world. And why did those murderers do that? God is as displeased as anybody. Maria told me about her cousin who worked in an office on the 104th floor of the World Trade Center, the second building to be attacked. And she, when the first building was attacked, she said to her boss, let's get out of here. And her boss says, I have a couple of phone calls to make. And she ran. She got down to the 61st floor, and her building was attacked. She made it. Her boss did not. 2001. Well
Church time again. And people can't even find a place to park. Isn't that nice? And it looks like we're in the tent. Oh, I thought we were all through with the tent. But that's where people are going. This beautiful weather this year. Beautiful weather. Ike says that the condominiums down the road from us, that they allow pets, cats and dogs. So I'm going down there and explore that. Our worship with a psalm that I have found especially poignant in these days as the earth is trembled, but yet our God is still a very present help in time of trouble. Quaropus folks, Quaropus White Plains. You see the sun is lifting the moisture off of the grass in the field early in the morning. Rusty slept in a house last night. And he was warm. How are we going to celebrate Glendora's 50 years in television? It started in September of the year 1951. And here it is 50 years later, September in the year 2001. I suppose we could do a history of it. Started at NBC Hollywood, Sunset and Vine, in September of the year 2001. Well, let's think about it. We could eat, we could drink soda pop, we could have a party, we could have a special. What will we do? Here are some jokes for you. The professor said to the student, what do you know about the speed of light? And the student says nothing except that it gets here too early in the morning. Do you know that you have a left side of the brain that controls the right side of the body and a right side of the brain that controls the left side of the body? That means therefore that only those people who are left-handed are in their right mind. And teenagers really brighten up a home, don't they, folks? They never turn off the lights. And Lincoln once walked nine miles to return a book, and now they close the libraries on his birthday to celebrate. Little League is where the kid on the mound has five basic pitches. pitches. A fastball, a slow ball, a curve ball, a sinker, and one that you will hope will get to the plate. At the lodge meeting, the announcement was made, we regret to announce that the grand invincible potentate of the lodge won't make it to the meeting tonight. 
His wife won't let him out of the house. And Billy said to his buddy Pete, How much money do you have in the bank? And Pete says, I don't know. I haven't shaken it lately. Here's what these screwballs at NCI did. NCI World Club. Lindor retrogrades to writing letters because of the non-feasance of MCI Worldcom. MCI sent Glendora a telephone to the wrong address. She never knew she had a telephone bill. And how can you pay a bill if you never received it? MCI suspended her regional and long-distance telephone. Simultaneously, because of the murderers at the World Trade Center, the banking centers in that area were disabled and Glendora could not do a wire transfer. There is no express mail. The $255.20 that bill was paid by postal money order on September the 13th, 2001, Thursday. It will be more than 72 hours without telephone, regional, and long distance after they take six to seven days to post it. Now listen to this. I'm going to call 949-949-5. Listen to what these quacks say. The dummies don't even tell you who we is. The dummies don't even tell you on what bill, because you have a local telephone company, and then you have a long distance and a regional telephone company, and they don't tell you that. Now, in addition to that, they have two other MCI numbers that we have with them. Two others. They could have checked that, and they could have seen what the correct address was. They could have called. You know, they're in the telephone business. They could have picked up the phone and called, but they did this with no notice. This is the first notice I got. This is the first. MCI Worldcom. As I told you, I was always a champion of MCI because the governor gave his life to break the AT&T monopoly, which is a great one. Thing. They broke it. The two dogs up in the Swiss Chalet, up, in the up, up on the hill where I've shown you, they've gone. They've gone back to their own. I miss them. Sparky and Shadow too. Now, about Raji, Rena Raji in the evil eastern district of New York, uh, that would be Brooklyn. Uh, when I sued Lemley and a whole bunch of uh, federal defendants, crooks down in the Eastern District of New York, New York you know who they are, Azraq and Levy and uh, Gershon and uh, Nickerson and Corman, a whole bunch of crooks. Uh, I sued them and uh, she stole the case from the state court. I sued them in the Nassau County Supreme Court. and. Uh, the United States government, uh, Gestapo style, steals the case from state court. It's got federal defendants in it. Then they haul this case into the federal court and they dismiss all their bodies, okay? And she sent the case, uh, finally remanded it, uh, back to the, I should say, just remanded to the Supreme Court, County of Nassau, State of New York. Well, I'm going to have to follow through on that in the, uh, Nassau County. But, I appeal Raji's bad order. One, she dismissed the case against the federal defendants, her buddies. And two, uh, when I said show cause, when she told me to show cause that uh, I had uh, that I had not failed to prosecute my case fully, I told her that I'm in former papyrus and the law is that she has to send the U.S. Marshal out and serve all of the other parties. And when I sent her that form to sign, that order to sign, she kicked it back to the Supreme Court, state of New York, County of Nassau. 
I peeled all those rotten, lousy decisions. And, uh, you have to peel them to the rotten, lousy second circuit. But anyway, they're not getting by. Me. Uh, legal papers that are going on at Cable Beach in Brookhaven, unbelievable. Uh, they infringe on Glendora Street Street for three months, the old Glendora 13 show. Uh, what else is going on? Uh, Gutman in Oklahoma City, unbelievable custody fight over the daughter. And uh, I have started that, and I'm going to start reading that on another uh, tape. So they should be all together in one program, and I'll send it out to Oklahoma so they'll put it on public access out there. Uh, that's two. Uh, three, I mentioned to you, Lemley and Nassau Supreme Court. Uh, four is uh, the Omnibus Six that includes suing MCI. Uh, five. is preparing for the Rye Court tomorrow night, Wednesday, taking that former greedy landlord who stole our certificate, our security deposit, I mean, uh, Godfrey South and his brat son, Mark South. Uh, the Texaco uh, annual report, uh, lots to read to you about that. And I think that's it, six legal papers that are going. Now this afternoon I have to go and have my picture taken at church for the directory, the church directory. So now I think that brings all the uh, reports up to date on today. Uh, the weather is perfect. The weather is just perfect. Uh, Tuesday, September 18, 2001, Anno Domini. Besides deer, we see little two-footed creatures. This is at 4 p.m. on Tuesday, September 19th. Isn't that cute? Two adults and four little two-critty, two-footed creatures. And the dog over here was barking. This is our backyard. Do you like it? feed the animals crackers. They don't like bread. That window is to the east. This one's to the south. And that's our side yard. Do you like that? We're at church and we're going to have our picture taken for the church directory. Yeah. It's five o'clock, September 18, 2001, Tuesday. I'm usually editing, but we postponed it because of taking the crooked landlord, Godfrey South, to the Rye City Court on Wednesday. And uh, yeah. mm -hmm. it's on. Uh, oh, isn't that nice? Yeah, it's a nice unit. Yeah, very nice. <laughs> Kids always make you feel good, don't they? <laughs> one forty, one twenty-five. Okay. Now, shall we just put the two favorite ones up there, or what do you think? No, that's good. Right there. That that's good. Okay, that's good. Keep it do keep going, and then I'm going to put the two best ones on. Okay. That's fun. And then fun. I'll do them big. That's fun if the computer does that. Here's the first one. That's going to go in the book. You still recording? Yep. The second one was just as good, but maybe a little more natural on the first one. 
this is the one you're going to get six wallets of. That's a well, nice I, I one. It's pretty good too. Oh, but then this is the one you're going to get. In addition to six no. wallets, you're going to get the free eight by ten, and then four touched up eight. Okay, so it's 143, right? Round All up. Together. 41.25. There you go, right back to you. Thank you. Now, for mailing purposes, um, well, it has to be box 416. Do, and I don't need a surname? No, nope. Glendora, box 416. My goodness, it won't go and it won't accept this. Let me put the same. White Plains, New York, 1602, 914, here I am, 30 years. Well, 27 years. Yeah, very good. I've never heard of it until we moved there. <laughs> oh, good, thanks. So now, Rusty, we take you for a walk. It is 6.30, Rusty. Oh, a good doggy. Let's go for a walk, Rusty. I don't know about that Olin Mills and Church directories. I think it's a frame-up. I think it's a racket. As soon as you get your picture taken, you go in and they get you to spend $143. I don't know about that. It's good to have photos. But I don't know. We fell for it at the church in the Highlands. And somewhere else. I think it was the church in the Highlands again. I don't know folks about that. So I came home and took care of my loved one, Franklin. He did a good job printing Cablevision Brookhaven. Too fast, right, folks? And Cablevision Brookhaven is ready to serve. And then, in between helping Franklin, Franklin sat down and watched the Dan Rather News. Franklin's Supper. And reviewed uh, Godfrey South, cheater landlord, because the court appearance is tonight. Wednesday at 7 o'clock in Rye, 60 miles from here. So, to bed and to sleep at 8.30 and get up at 3.30 to static. We can't get anything on the radio. And do the chores and finish reviewing volume two of Cheater South Landlord on Sun Mark South. Three quarters of an hour. From five to six, get Franklin up, and washed and dressed, and into his lazy boy chair. up his TV set, give him the telephone instrument, pack his lunch, pack Rusty's breakfast, pack Glenn's lunch,
load the Lincoln, and after $150, that alarm has upset everything again. The door locks don't work automatically. The car wouldn't even start, and you had to wiggle this and wiggle that. Try to turn off that crazy alarm. I wish we didn't have that alarm. I never even turned it on. And was fortunate we got the car to start. Over to the field that you just saw. Go pick up Rusty. Rusty has a warm place to sleep at night. He slept in Kevin's room on his blankets. Church of St. Dean, in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Ghost. Thank you, God, for this day. And all the good things are going with it. Rusty likes to ride in the front seat because he likes to be near me, so I scratch his ears. And at now the clock is out. No, sorry. And at 7:15, leave. I will be an hour late all day long. To get those people up. It wouldn't be fair to get them up at six o'clock so Rusty could go at six. And where are we off to? Lindbrook, Long Island, to edit six editions of the chapter. Queens, maybe, to Brooklyn, we can get through, to Manhattan, Neighborhood Network, Manhattan TV, if we can get through. And then, back up here, and if the, Kathy's not in bed, put Rusty their house. Isn't that wonderful? Rusty has a warm place to stay. Isn't that wonderful, Rusty? trucks on the parkways, but the police do not enforce this. This is Pickskill Hollow. Eighteen miles, seven forty AM and twenty minutes. Thank you. 
Sign Citizens Against Tolls. Visit our website. We hate tolls.
had some training because um, he bought a bakery and uh, make a long story short, uh, there, was a, uh, there was a legal problem and he apparently came out on top. And the question is, is that he wants to know, can I sue my attorney for not pr protecting me by letting me sign a confession of judgment? Uh, yes, you can. It's called legal malpractice. And there's another one that's um, even better. It's called disgorgement of fees. Uh, you'll see it in the uh, chapter on licensed land sharks in Son of Erwin Rommel, for those of you who have it. And disgorgement of fees simply means that the attorney didn't necessarily do you any harm. He just didn't get off his butt. It's a much easier cause of action to maintain and prosecute successfully than legal malpractice is. Basically, you're just saying, I paid you for services. You didn't deliver them. Give me my money back. Uh, the next one he wants to know is, can I sue opposing counsel because he presented false testimony uh, in court and so forth? And uh, well, maybe you can, maybe you can. You've got to check the, the state laws and statutes on this because uh, if every attorney could be sued for lying in court, Okay. Does anybody understand what ha would happen to the gross national product? Okay. Um, uh, he wants to know how to have a signature taken off an agreement altogether. I believe you'd call that rescinding a signature based on fraud, and you'd have to look that up in Anger Second and CGS in, in the States. Now, here's another fellow, apparently also had some training, has got this uh, problem <coughs> with the Social Security Administration, and uh, apparently he's whipped them a time or two, and and he's still going a couple of rounds with him, or th with them. Well, anytime you have a problem with a federal administrative agency, again, I covered it yesterday, I'll cover it again. Title V, United States Code, Section 706, Petition for Judicial Review of Administrative Agency Action. Normally what you have to do is you have to jump through the administrative hoops first. Most federal agencies will normally have what they call an administrative uh, appeal or procedure never goes beyond two stages, except in the federal prison system, it goes through three. Uh, how that is done is in your lawsuit cookbook using examples from back in the 70s of the Federal Bureau of Prisons administrative remedy forms. And what I learned real quick was uh, those forms definitely were a remedy, but not the way they were designed. Never ever use government paperwork the way it was designed or you'll lose. What I did was, is once I realized what a, what a farce the whole thing was, is I did the BP 9, 10, and 11 route. It's called Bureau of Prisons Remedy Forms, which is local, regional, national. And I never did those with the idea that anything was going to be solved. I did them because the morons answering them have no legal training, and they would literally shoot themselves in the foot so that by the time I had three of these forms with the answers typed on the bottom, I had all the exhibits I needed to attach to my federal lawsuit. Works every time because then they can't, back, can't come back and say, well, I didn't say that. They not only said it, but they signed it. And you can set all sorts of traps like this. The next one here is uh, he's got a uh, uh, IRS agents threatening to uh, come in his home and take his stuff and all that. And this does not appear to be someone uh, who thinks he doesn't have to pay any taxes. They've got a notice of lien against him for almost 6000 Whenever you have uh, people causing you problems, who are in the executive branch of the federal government. Remember the declaratory relief statutes that uh, I told you about? Well, I also told you about one, and I probably didn't cover it thoroughly enough, because if I had, then this question wouldn't have been asked, is that there is one statute for declaratory and injunctive relief that applies only to federal employees in the executive department. That's Title V, United States Code, Section 703. Now another one, we've got a fellow here, apparently uh, runs a pawn shop, and uh, somebody came in and one of his customers, or whatever, pulled a fast one on him, brought in one piece of electronic equipment. Uh, he went out the back, left someone else in charge. The guy switched the equipment, pawned it for $80, and the next thing he knows is he's got the local gendarmes telling him that um, uh, you know, he's taking in hot merchandise and so forth and so on. And uh, then there's, I guess, some uh, policewoman telling him uh, in front of customers that he runs a crooked business and blah, blah, blah. Well, uh, they've kind of stepped off in it in this one because, number one, the guy who switched it, that's fraud. Uh, number two, the legal action that was brought against him is called abuse of process. You'll find it in Prosser's Law of Torts. 
Uh, when I first saw it, I thought, wow, look at this. This means I can sue somebody because they sued me or they, they took me to court. Uh, and it's actually a fairly recent, according to the common law, uh, cause of action. It didn't actually arise till about the 18th century when some judge could see what was coming down and realized there wasn't anything uh, to deal with as far as, as principles, so he just created one. And it's been known as abuse of process ever since. And of course, the last is slander. Because, and I gotta, I gotta caution you on something. Now, anybody who wants to ask me about any of my competitors in this business, you know, I'll give you names for one very simple reason. The truth is an absolute defense to defamation. That's number one. Number two, an opinion is not actionable. In other words, if I say, you know, I think you're a jerk, well, you can't sue me for that. But on the other hand, if I say, you are a child molester, and I say it, in front of a witness or I write it to some to some third person you know you can take everything I own libel and slander uh, libel is written slander is spoken if someone in, uh, like if I tell Peter that uh, Peter you know I think you cheated a couple of people and I tell it to him to his face but there are no third parties present it's not slander so Again, be very, very careful when you get start one of these court fights. And i got to tell you, I have seen an awful lot of people on our side, they get a little bit of information. And I've even seen people that have taken some of your course material. They have taken a situation that um, doesn't even apply, and they just copy everything in the course material, and then they put it in the federal courts, and they don't understand that their situation doesn't fit What's in the example you've got? And remember, what you have in your hands right now, those are examples. You cannot just cookie cutter legal process. Lawyers do it all the time, that's why they lose. What you got, Harvey? Mike, on that uh, Yellow Pages case, uh, yeah. could that uh, be rolled into RICO? Why would you want to? Just to put more heat on them? No, see, here's what'll happen. You gotta be real careful with RICO. Mm -hmm because what happens is when a federal judge sees a pro se litigant invoking RICO, it's, it's kind of like, uh, say, you or me watching a 10-year-old playing with a thermonuclear device. They do not want you to litigate something like a RICO in federal court unless you're a RICO attorney getting 50 or 100,000 a case. And see, this is what you also have to be very careful of is because a statute is deadly, that doesn't necessarily mean you want to use it. You know, there's some things that just because you can doesn't mean you should, mm -hmm. all right? And what you want to do, for example, like, uh, let me tell you about the last uh, RICO I had an unfortunate experience with. It was out of uh, Nebraska. Now, my partner told me to RICO these people. Well, he was older. I thought he was wiser, all right? So I did. You know, and we lost it in the Eighth Circuit Court of Appeals, even though they overruled their own case law to do it. The odds are, if I had filed a Title 42 Section 1983 garden variety complaint like I did in Peter's case, I don't want it. So just because you can do something doesn't mean you should. What you want to do is do not necessarily what is the deadliest or what puts the most pressure on some, somebody. You want to do what's the most effective. In other words, you know, you don't hunt for mice with a land any tank weapon. Peter? Uh, there were uh, uh, a couple of questions to me um, uh, uh, off camera. Uh, regarding um, being prevented by court clerks from filing process and um, we have about two minutes left on state wondering. court clerks uh, I think in both cases yes oh. oh okay sixth amendment denial of access to the courts title 42 section 1983 it's a very simple action and the beauty of court clerks is this number one they're not immune from suit for anything all right and number two they're all bonded. In other words, the insurance company is going to pay you when you pass, go, and collect 200000 Now, there's some bad case law to the contrary in some circuits, so what you're going to have to do is you're going to have to look it out. But at the very least, you can light up a court clerk on a declaratory relief action, and no bureaucrat, and this is also in your course material in the Browns Lawsuit Cookbook, bear in mind that every time a lawsuit is filed against any type of state or government employee, that lawsuit goes in their personnel file. You know, somebody sues one of us here that doesn't work for state government. The lawsuit, when you're through with it, goes in file 13. Now, what do you think happens when some bureaucrat is up for promotion and you've got
three competitors and your bureaucrat, the one you really hate that you've sued once, someone else has sued another time and someone else has sued a third time, and you've got three dossiers laying out in front of you and one of them's full of lawsuits. What do you think happens to that person's career, Bill? Well, what about a court clerk? What about a judge who issues an order to a court clerk not to accept any filings from some people? You sue them both. What if it's already because he's already been sued? Then sue him again. Okay. I mean, it's like saying you get in the middle of the, r the ring and you've hit the guy once with a left jab. You know, are you going to quit? No. Okay. Now, That's what I've been telling him, but... Okay, well, some people you can't, you can't tell anything to. You just have to leave them alone. Um, <clears throat> now, Peggy Daddick's going to come up here in the next hour because she's got about 20 more minutes and some questions. Um, and I've got, what, seven seconds? Uh, ten. Ten seconds, okay. Peggy, after the next break, you're back on deck. Okay? And we'll be right back. Okay, earlier I had mentioned to you about the one big question that you needed to know how to ask, and that was when you went into the courts, to anyone in the court, and say to them, I have a procedural question that I would like to ask, and preface all of your questions with that. And during the break, someone came over to me who's here today, who works in one of the courts in Pennsylvania, and said to me, I am so glad that you said that because that's exactly what we're told to say and that's what we have to say and that's true and one thing that you have to learn when you initially go in is that is not to get angry with those people in the clerk's office I'm not saying they're your friends I'm not saying they're on your side for the most part but they are just doing their job and they're just doing what they're told to do and they're to and they all think that pro se litigants are idiots and when you come in there, I mean, they look for people with like little horns coming out of their heads and they expect, so when you go in dressed like an attorney, they don't think you're a pro se litigant. And you've got that advantage too. You come in, because an attorney can come in and ask the same question you just asked and get an answer. But he's got a suit on, he's carrying a briefcase. So put your suit on and carry a briefcase and you'll get a lot more answers. That's just what it boils down to. It's common sense when you go into the courts. Um, that was about questions. Let's see. There's also a, a saying that Michael Brown pounded into my head for the last three years that applies to going in and filtering out what's good and what's not good. And that especially applies to people who have been exposed to a lot of patriot mythology. And it goes like this. It's not what you don't know that'll kill you. It's what you think you know that just ain't so. And boy, I've got to tell you, that's true. My husband and I, once we got involved in this whole court fiasco disaster that our lives have turned into, have become very political. And we were at a post office on April 15th, about four years ago, collecting signatures on a gas tax petition. We're trying to get a local gas tax lowered from six cents. And I got arrested <laughs> because the local county commissioners didn't think we should be out there. And it was an illegal arrest and we went through the whole thing and I won it in criminal courts. But the point I'm trying to get to with that story is I didn't know Michael when that happened. And I went to some patriot group and they said, oh, when you get it, first thing you do when you go into court, don't take an oath. Because the Bible says this and this says that and everything. And I went in and I said, well, I can't take an oath because that's against my religion. Well, I had to spend four hearings. I had to go back to court four times and spend five hours explaining to this judge why I don't take an oath. And then I had, I mean, I just, do you want to do that with your time? I don't think so. Because where did I get to? Back to the same, but fine, he didn't make me take an oath. Big deal. I wasn't lying anyway. 
So I didn't care if I was going to take an oath. You have to look at it logically. You don't want to go in there and fight for no reason. You want to get to that end goal. You want to win. And if you're not headed toward that and you're getting sidetracked with all other crazy issues, you're going nowhere real fast and you're going to be there forever. So that's one thing you want to keep in mind is trying to filter things out. Michael talked about the Fair Debt Collections Act. This is a terrific thing to know about. We found out about this. My husband and I were in the library and Michael Brown and Peter like to refer to this kind of happening as coming from the library angels. We sat down at a table and there was a whole pile of papers there. And my husband said, see what that is. Somebody had left a bunch of Xerox copies. So we picked them up and we started looking through them. And it was a whole bunch of case law that showed you exactly how to take a lawyer into court and sue him in federal court when he's representing somebody who's suing you and trying to get money from you, but they're doing it, they've done something illegally. Fabulous, fabulous act. The Fair Debt Collections Act. In other words, even on a foreclosure type situation, if someone is foreclosing on your home and they haven't gone according to the requirements of the Fair Debt Collections Act, you can go and take, move the whole thing over to federal court and get them in federal court on that. So you need to do the research on it, but it's a good thing to keep in mind, especially if you know about this prior to your case happening, because a lot of things are, are very controlled by time guidelines. Uh, Fair Debt Collections Act, if you're going to use that, let's say somebody sues you in your state court and you want to be able to use that act to move it into federal court because you think you'll get a more fair playing ground there, you only have 30 days to do it from the time you get served with that lawsuit. So coming to this kind of a class is one of the best things you can do. You've got to be aware that when something happens, you've got to jump in and find out as fast as you can. Uh, election problems. Uh, how many of you have read uh, Vote Scam? Anybody here? Okay, there's a lot of problems in the elections throughout this country, and we ran into it where we were living, and very hard to fight an election situation that's wrong, even where you have the proof, unless you do it within three or four days in most states. You've got like three or four days to file a complaint. So all the more people that learn these things, the better off they're going to be. Uh, the Administrative Procedures Act that Michael was talking about, that's your real tool for going in and fighting your local government. And the more familiar you become with that, the better off you're going to be. In most states, they have a state-level Administrative Procedures Act, and then they have the Federal Administrative Procedures Act. So you need to become familiar with both of them. But that's the answer for that mayor that's standing there being a dictator, or those county commissioners that are standing there filling their pockets with your tax dollars instead of having the money go out for school systems, that type of thing. So if you want to fight, you've got to be armed with the law. And it's all over, and you can do so much good. Um, I had started a story about creating confusion, and that's one of the things that all of the lawyers fall back on, we've found. And Michael and I can really say this from a lot of experience, because at this point, our little $8,000 fraudulent mechanics lien that was filed against us has turned into 11 major lawsuits against all these attorneys, and it's 70, 70 attorneys on the other side that we're fighting. And you can do everything they can do. We go in and we take their depositions, and they have to go, and they have to come. We had depositions three weeks ago where we were doing the depositions of the last attorney we paid. He was from our church, fine pillar of the church man. Uh, took $40,000 from us in five weeks, and when we were walking into the trial, said, you're out of money, and left us hanging there on our own. And we were taking his deposition a few weeks ago, and he came to the deposition with four attorneys to represent him against me, sitting there, <laughs> asking him questions. And he had to answer, and he didn't want to answer, and, but he did. And we had to come back for three days because he did everything he could not to answer. We had to go to the judge in between, but there are rules. You have discovery rules, and the discovery rules say you're allowed to get the information that's relative to your lawsuit. You can get subpoenas issued to get documents that you need. You can put in motions for requests for production of documents. You can do interrogatories. All of those things are within your power, and they're simple. Interrogatories, questions that relate to your cases. That's all in your civil rules of procedure and it just arms you better. If you don't have all the information in your hand and you know some of it's there, you can get it through the discovery process. 
Um, I work with some people helping them go through representing themselves at this point. And they say to me, and it's one of everyone, I think it's everyone's biggest fear, well, okay, I learned this little bit about what I'm doing, and then I go into court, and here's the judge that knows everything about the law and the attorney, and they're going to come and say all these things that I don't know what they mean. Well, they can't, okay? And that's part of your due process rights, because when you have a hearing, you have to get notified of the hearing. Michael talked about it. You have notice. That means they say to you, we're having a hearing on Tuesday, and that, Tuesday, that motion, is, that hearing, excuse me, is about a motion to dismiss. So you have to do all the research on a motion to dismiss and what applies to that in your case. You have to go to the library, read about dismissals. You don't have to know about summary judgment. You don't have to know about anything else. You just have to know about what's in their motion, how you're going to respond to it, and what your stand is going to be. Because the minute they start talking about something that you didn't know was going to be discussed and is not related to that motion to dismiss and the issues that they raised in it, you say, excuse me, but I can't answer that today because I had no notice this was going to be discussed and I'm not prepared to. And I would like a continuance on this hearing if that's what's going to be discussed. And the judge will do that because if he doesn't, that's a denial of your due process rights. So he will give you a continuance. So you go in there and you have to be, the point is you have to be very, very focused. That's not the time to tell your whole story. That's not the time to go in and make that judge understand that you're really right. That's the time to go in and respond to the motion that you're there about. That's where pro se litigants make a big mistake. They think, oh, as soon as I can get in front of the judge, I can tell my whole story, it's all over. It doesn't work that way. At the trial, that's when you tell your story. The other times, you're just going through, as Michael likes to say, you're running a procedural gauntlet. They make you do it. It's aggravating, but you have to do it. And you have to learn how to do it. And the thing is, you can do it better than them if you go in prepared. If you go in and do the research, Michael and I spent hours and hours, but the things that you learn will never leave you. They're there for the rest of your life. And you can help the guy that lives next door to you, your family, no one will ever be able to get you that way again once you learn about the law. I mean, it's something they really should be teaching us in school. We should get out of high school knowing how to go into court by ourselves. Why not? Because the lawyers wouldn't be able to make us believe the way they have convinced most of us that this is a big, mysterious world and that you need years and years of formal legal training. I t I'll tell you right now, I'll go up against anybody that just came out of law school, and I guarantee you that I know more than they do. And I certainly can represent myself better in court than they can because they're shaking like crazy when they come in and go in front of that judge. I was too, but that doesn't last long. Four hearings, five hearings, the jitters go away, and you're able to just focus and do what you need to do once you get in there. You have a very good book that was given to you uh, as part of your package. It's called Ways and Means. If you need to write a motion, take a look at that book. It's fabulous. The, out, the nice, clear, crisp motions. You just need to get your facts out. Don't clutter things up. Nobody reads a whole lot. Michael told you about that. Michael also mentioned uh, that we have somebody in Florida who is no longer allowed to file any lawsuits because he filed over 250. And that's true. But this guy had problems. He wasn't paying attention to the law, okay? He thinks he can go and get around the law and get past the law. Because if what you're filing is valid and you have valid causes of action, they can't do that to you. You have a right to file a lawsuit and you have a right to proceed through the courts. You can go all the way to the Supreme Court. It's not easy to get there because they only take a very small percentage of cases. So you really don't want to have to go all the way up there. You'd like to win before you get up there. But a uh, couple of other things. I'm just trying to hit on some very important points. Records, okay. Michael talked about building a record. Court systems are different all over the country. In West Palm Beach and in Florida in general, they do not provide you with a court reporter when you go in for a hearing in a civil case. You need to find out if in your courthouse where you're fighting if you have a court reporter that's supplied by the court. And whether you do or whether you do not, 
uh, we highly recommend that you bring your own court reporter with you and there are a number of, reason, of reasons for this. Transcripts do get changed. Stenographers do have loyalties to attorneys and law firms that they work with. We had it happen to us. We had one case where we, a judge completely illegally dismissed the case. It was a completely illegal ruling and the stenographers altered five or six words in the transcript and had it remained that way we would not have been able to appeal because of the way those words were changed. Fortunately I had a tape recorder with me and it was out on the table. Most courts today we're finding will allow you to bring in a tape recorder. The federal courts no, but most state courts do allow it. Um, but what we recommend is that you not only hire a stenographer, that you bring your tape recorder if you can with you, but also that you look for, there is a new group of uh, court reporters coming out, they're called ERCs, and they do electronic reporting. You'll see them in the criminal courts, they have this little machine. These people are powerhouses because they're recording everything word for word. The machinery has the ability, the capability of separating out up to eight voices talking at the same time. And that will happen to you in court. If you're making a very valid point and you're starting to get your point across and the attorney on the other side realizes it and he knows the judge is starting to realize that what you're saying is true and that you're really bringing in the law and the, ju the judge is going to say, wait a minute here, there's something wrong. First thing that attorney is going to do is jump up out of, his, out of his seat, start objecting, talking over you, talk to the judge. And because they don't do it to each other, the attorneys don't do this to each other, okay? They're very polite. One gets up and speaks, the other one waits, then he gets up and speaks, and they don't over talk each other. But when it's a pro se litigant and you start saying something that mean, makes sense, they will jump up and talk over you so that you can't get your words out. And they know they'll throw you off track. You know, and then you never get back to that important point that you were making. But if you have an elect someone recording that electronically who can separate out those voices, it will come out in the transcript. You can bring it back and have the judge take judicial notice if the ruling comes out the wrong way. That paper, that transcript is so important if you want to be able to appeal. We have a court reporter that we bring with us. I've got to tell you, when we walk into the room with this court reporter, the, if the attorneys had bayonets in their hands, she'd be gone. <laughs> there is just no way she would still be there because we would not still be there if we didn't have her. She has been a lifesaver for us. It's not that expensive. They charge you, it depends, between $30 to $50 for an appearance, for a short hearing. It might be like $125 for, say, a half-day deposition. If you don't need the transcript, that's all you pay. They hold those, those records for seven years so that if you do need it, you can go back and get it. But when you're first doing this, those transcripts are very beneficial because you can go back and see exactly what it is that you, that you did wrong. And you make mistakes, you know, so the next hearing you're that much better because you go and you say, oh, I shouldn't have done that or I shouldn't have done this. Because this confusion creating that the attorneys do, that's their only weapon against you as a pro se litigant. I've had attorneys say to me, you don't realize but you are an attorney's worst nightmare, a pro se litigant that knows what he's doing. You are, because there's no stopping you. They can't stop us. My, my husband walks down the courthouse always saying, we don't care if it takes 20 years, we're not going away. They die. They really hate to hear that. I mean, that's the first thing he says to somebody if we lose at a hearing. It's okay, we'll come back, and we, because we're not going away, because we know we're right. We've certainly been in there too long. But if you go in armed in the beginning, it won't take that long. We had attorneys really mess up our case. That's why it's taken so much. Um, as far as paperwork, building the record, just some little things. When you go in to file papers, you have to bring, the original always gets filed in court, and a copy gets stamped by the clerk for your records. That is very, very important. Anybody who's been fighting and is getting anywhere has probably had the experience of your paper just didn't somehow get filed. They just couldn't find where that great motion went to. But if you have a stamped copy from the clerk, we had it happen about three months ago. We had a hearing in federal court and uh, we knew that the papers were not getting to the judge. And we managed to go to the chief judge. We had to do some real jumping around on this. And uh, the judge who had the case called a hearing. 
and it would, he, we had four attorneys there on the other side, the Attorney General from Florida, because we're suing one of the judges, and my husband and I on our side, and three other attorneys for some of the other people that are involved. And uh, we went in, and the judge right away said, well, now, Mrs. Daddick, you can come up to the microphone, and, and you'll get a chance to, he thought I knew nothing, you'll get a chance to talk. First, this attorney's going to say, the attorney got up and lied a little bit. And then I got up, and I said, well, Your Honor, I'd like to explain to you. He said, I want to ask you something, Mrs. Daddick. He said, I've got some papers, and it seems that you think I'm not getting your papers. You, you think that I'm not getting them. Is that right? And I said, yes, I do. And he said, well, what makes you think that? I said, well, Your Honor, we filed papers here, and if I file my papers on Thursday, by Friday afternoon, I have an order back that the motion's been dismissed. And I've been fighting in the court for five years, and I know it usually takes three or four months for a federal judge to look at a motion. And this happened to us five times in the last three weeks. So the last motion that we filed, we hired a process server, and we had him come into your chambers to serve it to you, but your clerks wouldn't let him in. And they said, no, the judge refuses to accept this. So the judge says, he started looking at his clerk, who got absolutely ten shades of gray and then white sitting over in the corner and he said well where's the file and the clerk said oh your honor we didn't have the file up here for the hearing so he stopped everything and he sold, and he sent the bailiff downstairs to get the file and the bailiff came back up with the file and he said well what is it that you think I didn't get Mrs. Daddick so I pulled out my first motion I said well we have this motion your honor that uh, we really felt you were going to rule in our favor on and he started flipping through the book. And then he started really flipping through the book. And about 10 minutes into looking through the book, he still couldn't find that motion. And there were five other motions that he couldn't find. But I had my stamped copies with me. Are the law clerks still there that did that? I don't know. I can't get to the judge's chambers anymore. OK, but, all, but the judge said at the end of the hearing, Mrs. Daddick, when this is all over, you're going to go downstairs with Mr. Daddick, and you're going to stay in that clerk's office until this file gets straightened out. Sounded like I did something wrong, but that was okay. We got it straightened out. But that's the kind of thing you'll run into. You have to watch those files. Michael said, Michael wasn't kidding when he said, you've got to call that courthouse or physically go down there. If that's possible, that's even better. And check that file, because when you're a pro se litigant, and you know what you're doing, and you're fighting with the law, they don't want you to win. Because if you win, and other people find out about it, they're gonna say, hey, I can do that. I don't need to pay that attorney either, okay? And the sad part is, if the attorneys didn't charge us all so much money, we wouldn't mind paying them, but we really wouldn't mind paying them if they went in and did exactly what we've gotta to learn to do, because they won't do it. You don't have much of a choice if you can't find somebody to fight for you. Um, focus, we talked about, very, very important. I can't stress anything that I feel is more important than continuing to learn about this. When you're in a case, you have, your whole life has to focus on it. There just isn't anything more important. You can't say, well, I'd rather go out to dinner with my friends or I'd rather go to the movies. If you've got an important case, your mind has to be focused on that case most of the time. And that's how you'll win it. And if you get in early enough, it could be over in a matter of weeks or months. It doesn't have to take years and years, but you've got to make it a priority in your life, because if it isn't, you cannot win it. But believe me, it's worth the price. Uh, that's about all I really have. Um, if anybody has any questions, if not, Peter? <laughs> I mean, I could go for another two days if you want. <laughs> we have uh, 20 minutes. If you have a oh, question. Oh, I'd be glad to. Questions uh, right yeah. here, please. Uh, quickly, let's move it along here. Uh, the this is a republic, not a democracy. Let's get going. Is this for Michael? No, this is for you, Peggy. Um, okay. It's a very simple question. I'd just like to know what your background is, if you have paralegal experience or... Oh, okay, that's a good question. This will show you you can all do it. Before we got involved in this, 
What I did for a living was I painted houses with my husband. You don't need to be a genius to do this. You just need to be able to read and apply yourself and listen to people and listen to the right directions. I mean, if had I not, had Michael and I not met Michael Brown, could we have survived this? I don't think so. Because there are a lot of people out there that are really willing to give you bad information. And to reinvent the wheel yourself is a hard thing to do. I mean, even if you look at young attorneys who come out of law school, they're going in, they're working for a firm, there's somebody that has the experience, the background to plan strategy. That's what Michael was talking about earlier. You, need, you can't all of a sudden know that. You really do need to have it. That's where Erwin Rommel, that's where all of this information is going to help you a whole lot because it is strategy and you've got to out-strategize the lawyers on the other side. And when we come into court and there are, uh, some of our hearings, there's 10, 14 lawyers on the other side. You know, they hate us. They can't stand us. They wish we would have went away years ago. And I mean, we just had a hearing, I guess it was about six weeks ago. <clears throat> All right, I'll, I'll take another 10 minutes of your time. <laughs> okay. When this started out, for us, it was this fraudulent mechanics lien. We were building a, our dream house in South Florida, and uh, at the end of the, the building project, the roof failed inspection. This is what got us thrown into the courts. And uh, the builder, rather than going to the roofer and saying, make the roof right, went to the county and kept having them come back and inspect and inspect and inspect and they kept failing the roof and they failed it five times and then on the sixth time they got some inspector that obviously they paid off who came out and went up into the attic to inspect the roof and this is cement tile roof with nail nails that hold it on and you have to see the nails coming through the sheeting I know all this about roofs that I never cared about before in my life right so he went up to look at it. This was the sixth inspector, and he went up and came back down. And he said, roof's fine. So my husband and I were standing down there. Michael, had, My husband, Michael, had gone up with the inspector, but I didn't go up in the roof. So they came down. He said, oh, the roof's fine. It passes. So I said to him, well, wait a minute. Wait a minute. I said, I don't know anything about roofs, but there were five inspectors out here that came out, failed this roof. Nobody did anything. You went up there, you come, you say, okay, it's fine. Can you explain? some papers and it seems that you think I'm not getting your papers. You, th you think that I'm not getting them. Is that right? And I said, yes, I do. And he said, well, what makes you think that? I said, well, Your Honor, we filed papers here and 
if I file my papers on Thursday, by Friday afternoon I have an order back that the motion's been dismissed. And I've been fighting in the court for five years, and I know it usually takes three or four months for a federal judge to look at a motion. And this happened to us five times in the last three weeks. So the last motion that we filed, we hired a process server, and we had him come into your chambers to serve it to you, but your clerks wouldn't let him in. And they said, no, the judge refuses to accept this. So the judge says, he started looking at his clerk, who got absolutely ten shades of gray and then white sitting over in the corner. And he said, well, where's the file? And the clerk said, oh, Your Honor, we didn't have the file up here for the hearing. So he stopped everything and he, saw, and he sent the bailiff downstairs to get the file. And the bailiff came back up with the file. And he said, well, what is it that you think I didn't get, Mrs. Daddick? So I pulled out my first motion. I said, well, we have this motion, Your Honor, that uh, we really felt you were going to rule in our favor on. And he started flipping through the book. And then he started really flipping through the book. And about 10 minutes into looking through the book, he still couldn't find that motion. And there were five other motions that he couldn't find. But I had my stamped copies with me. Are the law clerks still there that did that? I don't know. I can't get to the judge's chambers anymore. Okay, but, all, but the judge said at the end of the hearing, Mrs. Daddick, when this is all over, you're going to go downstairs with Mr. Daddick, and you're going to stay in that clerk's office until this file gets straightened out. Sounded like I did something wrong, but that was okay. We got it straightened out. But that's the kind of thing you'll run into. You have to watch those files. Michael said, Michael wasn't kidding when he said, you've got to call that courthouse or physically go down there. If that's possible, that's even better. And check that file. Because when you're a pro se litigant and you know what you're doing and you're fighting with the law, they don't want you to win. Because if you win and other people find out about it, they're going to say, hey, I can do that. I don't need to pay that attorney either. Okay, and the sad part is, if the attorneys didn't charge us all so much money, we wouldn't mind paying them, but we really wouldn't mind paying them if they went in and did exactly what we've got to learn to do, because they won't do it. You don't have much of a choice if you can't find somebody to fight for you. Um, focus, we talked about, very, very important. I can't stress anything that I feel is more important than continuing to learn about this. When you're in a case, you have, your whole life has to focus on it. There just isn't anything more important. You can't say, well, I'd rather go out to dinner with my friends, or I'd rather go to the movies. If you've got an important case, your mind has to be focused on that case most of the time. And that's how you'll win it. And if you get in early enough, it could be over in a matter of weeks or months. It doesn't have to take years and years, but you've got to make it a priority in your life, because if it isn't, you cannot win it. But believe me, it's worth the price. Uh, that's about all I really have. Um, anybody has any questions? If not, Peter? Uh -huh. I mean, I could go for another two days if you want. <laughs> we have uh, 20 minutes. If you have a oh, question. Oh, I'd be glad uh, to. Questions uh, right yeah. here, please. Uh, quickly, let's move it along here. Are the questions for this Peggy is a republic, not a democracy. Let's get going. Is this for Michael? No, this is for you, Peggy. Um, okay. It's a very simple question. I'd just like to know what your background is, if you have paralegal experience. or. Oh, okay, that's a good question. This will show you you can all do it. Before we got involved in this, what I did for a living was I painted houses with my husband. <laughs> you don't need to be a genius to do this. You just need to be able to read and apply yourself and listen to people and listen to the right directions. I mean, if had I not, had Michael and I not met Michael Brown, could we have survived this? I don't think so because there are a lot of people out there that are really willing to give you bad information. And to reinvent the wheel yourself is a hard thing to do. I mean, even if you look at young attorneys who come out of law school, they're going in, they're working for a firm, there's somebody that has 
the experience, the background to plan strategy. That's what Michael was talking about earlier. You, need, you can't all of a sudden know that. You really do need to have it. That's where Erwin Rommel, that's where all of this information is going to help you a whole lot because it is strategy and you've got to out strategize the lawyers on the other side. And when we come into court and there are, uh, some of our hearings, there's 10, 14 lawyers on the other side. You know, they hate us. They can't stand us. They wish we would have went away years ago. And I mean, we just had a hearing, I guess, it was about six weeks ago. <clears throat> All right, I'll, I'll take another 10 minutes of your time. <laughs> okay. When this started out, for us, it was this fraudulent mechanics lien. We were building a, our dream house in South Florida, and uh, at the end of the, the building project, the roof failed inspection. This is what got us thrown into the courts. And uh, the builder, rather than going to the roofer and saying, make the roof right, went to the county and kept having them come back and inspect and inspect and inspect and they kept failing the roof and they failed it five times and then on the sixth time they got some inspector that obviously they paid off who came out and went up into the attic to inspect the roof and this is a cement tile roof with nail, nails that hold it on and you have to see the nails coming through the sheeting I know all this about roofs that I never cared about before in my life right so he went up to look at it. This was the sixth inspector, and he went up and came back down. And he said, roof's fine. So my husband and I were standing down there. Michael had, my husband, Michael, had gone up with the inspector, but I didn't go up in the roof. So they came down. He said, oh, the roof's fine. It passes. So I said to him, well, wait a minute. Wait a minute. I said, I don't know anything about roofs. But there were five inspectors out here that came out, failed this roof. Nobody did anything. You went up there. You come. You say, okay, it's fine. Can you explain how that happened? He said, dead serious. Typical government agency. Oh, the other five inspectors had weak batteries in their flashlights. <laughs> now, I'm from New York, and I don't buy that kind of garbage. <laughs> so I said, I'll tell you what. You give me a statement in writing that that roof meets code, and that's fine. We'll accept that. Well, six weeks later, we're still fighting for this letter in writing. Now the building official that's in charge of the building department comes out and says, uh-uh, it's no good. It fails. <coughs> so now we're back and we say, okay, fine. What happens next? Well, the builder went to the bank. And he said to the bank, the house is finished. We got a roof that has to come off. This is what the county's saying. The roof has to come off the house and be replaced on a new house. He goes to the bank. He says, the house is done. And we had signature authority to release the funds for the last 10%. But nobody realized that. They gave him the money. So now we got the bank did something wrong. The county issues him a conditional certificate of occupancy that they can only issue to the owner of the house. They make their mistake, right? Now we go through this little administrative board called the Construction Board of Adjustments and Appeals, our personal little kangaroo court in West Palm Beach. And there's a bunch of guys sitting up there. They're supposed to be a plumber, electrician, a general contractor. But the guy that's the head of the board, he's sick that day. And we're talking about our roof and whether or not it has to come off because the builder's appealing it. He doesn't think he should have to fix it. So who's the head of the board that day? A roofing contractor. Well, we go through this charade of a hearing, and we're calling this family attorney who's saying to us, oh, don't worry about it. You don't need an attorney for that. This is just you know, a little, little procedure they do down the county. You just go, make sure you're there. You'll be fine. Oh, yeah, we were fine. They didn't let us say anything. We brought a roofing expert with us. They didn't let him say anything. And at the end of this hearing, the guy, the roofer, stands up and says, well, we think, this is our decision, we think that the roof doesn't meet code, but he doesn't have to fix it. <laughs> oh, great. You know, what does this mean? So we get out and we say to this building, the administrator for the whole building department, well, what do we do next? And he says, that's the end. There's nothing you can do. Okay, so now we said, oh, wow, now we've got a $30,000 roof we've got to replace. And in the meantime, we get home that night, and there's a knock on the door, and the builder files a fraudulent mechanics lien against us, saying not only 
this whole problem with the roof, but we owe him $8,000 that we don't owe him. All right, now we've got a bad roof and a lawsuit. So we go and we get an attorney, big law firm. And we get the attorney and he says, oh, no problem, I'll sue the bank, I'll do this, I'll do that, we'll take care of the whole thing, we'll get you all your money back. We give him all the papers, we say, it's off our shoulders. And nothing happens for like a year. And we go away, we, we had a job, a painting job up in New York, we went back up to New York for the holidays and we came back on New Year's Eve to a pile of paper because the attorney who we called and said, listen, we're going to New Jersey for Christmas, as soon as we, went, we left Florida, went to court and said, I want to withdraw from this case. Didn't notify us did, because we weren't there. Went in, the judge let him out. We get back from Florida and we're like two weeks away from a trial. No, no attorney. Now we start our rounds in the court and we're getting this, I can't give you legal advice. And we're saying, but we just need to talk to the judge. We just need to tell him we have more time. I can't give you legal advice. You have to write him, you have to file a motion. Did I know what that meant? I didn't have a clue. I'm writing letters and letters and letters and nobody's reading them because that's called ex parte. You cannot write a letter to a judge. Don't ever think you can. Don't think you can convince a judge that you're right by writing him a letter. You have to go in and file a paper in that court and anything you file in that court, you've got to make sure the other side has. That's how our disaster started. Well. We got another attorney. That was the one from our church. And he came in and he said, well, I'll take care of this for you, no problem. I'll sue the county, I'll sue this one, I'll sue that one, okay. We get into the first set of depositions. He calls us for depositions and he calls this little weasel of a builder. This is not a, build, a big builder that we're fighting, folks. This is one little guy with two brothers and they had this this little construction company, and the day they took our deposit, they took our deposit money, two of the brothers who did all the work on the houses, the one brother sat in the office and the other two went out and did the actual work. Well, the two that did the work took our deposit money, went out to the middle of Florida that night, out to Okeechobee, this little old town out in the middle of Florida, and got arrested by the FBI for buying cocaine from the FBI. That was our deposit money, okay? And then the rest of our money went trying to get these jokers out of jail. But did we, we didn't have a clue this was going on. Okay, we, we were a year into all of this lawsuit before we found out that those two guys had been in jail. This can hit you out of nowhere. So the best thing you can possibly do is learn about the system before you actually get in there. Then you go in, we were, so we were trying to get to the judge just to say, we need, 10 or 20 days to find another lawyer. Finally, after we'd gone back to the judge's judicial assistant for the third time, we said to her, I said, I don't know, how do I find out how to write a motion? She said, wait a minute, because she was really annoyed. She, we were there three days in a row, that's pushing it. She pulled some papers out of her garbage pail that some attorney had filed earlier that morning, and she said, here, here's the motion, this is what you have to do. The judge is in his chambers every morning at 8.45. Now this is something you need to find out about if you're fighting in a court suit. Some courts, they have open hearing time. It's kind of like a good way for lawyers to make quick money because what they do is you can go in there, it's who comes first gets called first. You have a five minutes for each side on the hearing. Most courts have this, maybe once a month, maybe once a week. Our courts in West Palm, because they like the lawyers to make a lot of money, we have it four days a week. So you file a motion, you send it to the other side, and you send them a notice that says, we're going to have this hearing on Tuesday, March 25th. And everybody shows up at 845. Who comes first signs in if you don't get called by, say, 9 o'clock when the judge has a trial starting? You've got to come back another day. That's when the lawyer sends you a bill and says, the judge just couldn't get to us. That's because he didn't get there until 9 o'clock, and everybody had already been heard. But we went in and went to this first judge, all dressed up, got into the courthouse, into the courtroom, and it was Judge Wessel sitting behind the bench then. And he said, next, and I was watching real careful. I saw those attorneys get up, go up to the microphone, the podium, and say, good morning, Your Honor, we're here about this. So I got up, I said, good morning, Your Honor. My name is Peggy Daddick, and we're here this morning because we need more time to get another attorney. And he said, where are the attorneys on the other side? 
And I said, I don't know. And he said, bailiff, get her out of the courtroom. And I said, but I, but, 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 and I was, the bailiff helped me get out of the courtroom. So now I was out in the, Michael and I are out in the hallway. We had no idea what to do, but we knew we couldn't go in there. It, I mean, this is a tough thing, folks. You have to understand. Freedom of speech doesn't count in the courtroom. You've got to go in there and play by their rules. You cannot go in when the other side doesn't know you're going. If you set a hearing and they don't show up, that's a whole different story, as long as you've got proof that they were notified. Anything you do, if there's an attorney on the other side, Anything you mail out, you mail out certified mail so you get a receipt for it because the attorney's favorite line when there's a pro se litigant on the other side is, Your Honor, I never got that. We had a lawyer say that one morning when in Judge Alvarez, Michael and I went in, this is a legal malpractice case that we have filed against two of the attorneys that represented that crooked builder. We went in for a hearing and we're sitting there and I get up and I, I'm saying my part of the motion and the attorney on the other side stands up and says, Your Honor, I never got a notice of this hearing. And Judge Alvarez looked at him and said, Well, how'd you get here? <laughs> but let me tell you, not too many judges are that good. But they do it. I mean, they lie and they lie. If you're right, they're gonna lie. That's guaranteed because they're used to it. They get away with it. They lie when there's other attorneys there. It's all about who can lie better. But when you go in, you don't dare lie because that's the only thing that's going to carry you through is the truth and what you're fighting with and knowing the law. You don't go in and make anything up because they're a whole lot better than any of us at lying. That's their profession. I'm convinced of it. I have not met an honest lawyer yet. And so, as soon as I start thinking one of them is honest, he shows me how wrong I am. I got to tell you. I mean, they go in and they will flat out lie to a judge about anything. We've had them go, and we have it in transcripts, and it's tough to get it worked out. Michael said, sue them for fraud on the court. It's hard. It can be done, but it is hard. So you've got to go in there and try to get your points out as quickly as possible in as narrow a way as possible. That's another mistake we made. In the beginning, we couldn't figure out what our story was. I mean, how do you tell somebody that it's, the builder did this, the roofer did this, the, then the judge wouldn't let me in the courtroom, then, and it's become so, you have to focus, you have to narrow, you have to figure out what your important issues are. Those are the ones that you want to fight. You don't want to fight everything in the world. You don't go into a hearing and try to make 25 points. You go in and you try to make one or two. That's where a lot of pro se litigants will really have a problem. I had a guy last week, all he had to do was to go into court. This is a situation, it's a foreclosure. And we had been able to move the case out of state court to federal court. And in the federal court, the judge took a look at it and decided that he was going to send it back to state court. So in the interim period, we filed a motion for reconsideration, which means we found other points that we felt the judge had missed and we wanted him to relook at the situation. You can do that within 10 days. And we put that motion in. Now in the meantime, the builder that was foreclosing on this guy's house had one attorney up in Jacksonville who was fighting this out about whether or not the case should stay in federal court. But the builder had another attorney way down South Florida who goes into the state court where the foreclosure was first filed and starts asking for a default judgment. That means nobody answered this lawsuit, so we win. But it had been answered. It had been answered up in the federal court when it was moved over there. So I said to this guy, all you have to do is go into the hearing and explain one thing to the judge. This is it. You go up there and you say, Your Honor, one lawsuit can't be in two different courts. This man has a lawyer fighting one thing up in Tallahassee, and now he's coming down here and asking you to, th to look at the same lawsuit. But this guy went down there and thought, this is the time to tell the judge his whole story. What happened? The judge said, because he never said what I told him to say. He never focused on what the issue was. The issue was this court had no jurisdiction. It didn't. Question of jurisdiction. Does that court have the right to hear it when the federal court has it? No. But he didn't say that. He went in and said, this man can't foreclose on my house because I made these payments and this and that. That's not the time to say that. So the judge said, you've got 10 days to answer it. 
Now we have a big problem because you hear anyone who's gone to the Patriot meetings, you probably have heard a lot about jurisdiction. Jurisdiction is a real valid issue. If a court does not have jurisdiction over you, someone didn't, someone serves you with a lawsuit, okay, and they don't, they just send it in the mail, you never get service of process. If you go into that courtroom and you start talking, even though you never got served, and you start talking about the lawsuit and what the lawsuit is about, you just volunteered into the jurisdiction of that court. Doesn't matter if they didn't serve you, nothing matters. So it's something that you want to watch very carefully. Oh, I'm sorry. I thought you just wanted to stand. <laughs> but This is for Michael. Okay. okay. Yeah. Oh, okay. Okay. Uh, okay, so going back to the issue of jurisdiction. Oh, right here. Here's a lady right here with a question. Here's a gentleman with a question, too. Okay. Oh, okay. He's just a little patient. Peggy, this is a question that has to do with jurisdiction as well. Um, I live in North Carolina. There happens to be a West Palm Beach attorney who lies to a 67-year-old widow who lost her daughter in a tragic automobile accident from a year and a half ago. And he lie, he's collected over a quarter million dollars in fees, and he lies to this woman. I happen to know this woman very well. She's my mother. Um, State it real quick. We're out of time. State it quick. The question is, I want to file suit against this attorney for engorgement of fees or deception or uh, just flat out uh, violating his ca uh, canons of rules of ethics. How do I go about it in federal court? Is he your mother's attorney? Yes, and was also mine. Okay. I'm uh, planning to get that. Yeah, you, you can certainly file it under. How much money is involved? Two hundred and some thousand dollars. He's collected over a quarter million dollars. Oh yeah, case. you can. You've got ju diversity jurisdiction that Michael well, talked about well, there. <laughs> it is. Yeah, it is. Son of Erwin Rommel has a lot of good answers on that, and uh, you can definitely do it. Talk to me it. later. Tell me who the attorney is. I probably know him. <laughs> David Feingold, the public building. <laughs> yeah, I probably sued him, that's true. <laughs> Peter, I give you time. I thought you should expand more on explaining to people when you're helping them or they're getting help from this education that they should focus on that instead of going to a friend or a patriot or something because they can't serve two gods at one time. This is a very important point. I touched on that a bit earlier, but it is a, a problem that I run into with pro se litigants. I've got to tell you people, when Michael and I are fighting in the courts, if we get a motion in the mail today, and I don't have anything else on my plate that in any of the lawsuits, that's what gets my first attention. Because when you get something in, a, in the mail, a lot of times you only have three, five, ten days to respond to it. You don't know how long it's going to take you to go and do the research that you need to put a response together back to that. So you don't wait until the night before to go and do your research. You go down immediately and start getting your answers. And you get as much as you can. And when you do research, okay, let's, let's take an example. <clears throat> Michael was talking yesterday about you get, you put in a lawsuit against somebody and you get a motion back to set aside the whole complaint, or I'm sorry, not to set aside, you get a motion to dismiss for failure to state a claim. Well, the first thing you have to do is go to the law library and find out not only why you're right, but you have to find out why the other side is wrong. Okay, you've got to look at the whole picture. You can't go, people will tell you that teach other seminars, go out there, find a case that's similar to yours, and then you just go show that to the judge. It's just not that simple, okay? It's, you have to go out and find a case that says why that case that you have with those type of issues cannot be dismissed so that you can go into that judge when you go in to fight that motion and say, Your Honor, this case says A, B, C, and D, and here's the case law, and I have a copy for you, and I have a copy for the attorney on the other side, and you've got to know that case law, and it's just not that hard. Those cases are out there. And I'm going to tell you something, when you go in that prepared and you win and that attorney loses, there just isn't a better feeling in the world.
And I will tell you from personal experience, no, there isn't. We are the Erwin Rommel School of Law, and our Babylonian ghetto address is care of 4842 North Magnolia, Chicago, Illinois, 60640-4710. Our phone is 773-878-0681, dedicated fax 0682. We are going to lunch. You get 60 minutes, and it's battle stations in 60 minutes. Thank you very much. All right, let's get, uh, I've got a few loose ends here I need to tie up, and uh, I will be out of your face before the end of this set. Uh, if any of you want to ask questions of me, you're going to have to come up here, uh, and you're going to have to do it fairly soon, because I should be through with this fairly easily. Uh, Peggy, when I get through, are you up to another set? Okay, what I'm going to do is, is I'm going to go, I'm going to put Peggy on when I get, when she gets through, Dwayne Rogers comes on, so when I'm through with this these few last notes I've got for you. Uh, I'm through for the day, or actually for the weekend, and uh, <clears throat> then, you know, my other officers will take over and finish you up. First thing I want to point out, uh, you may have noticed that Peggy isn't bashful, and uh, I've got to tell you, well, let me tell you how good she is, because she will never tell you this herself. She's so good in an open courtroom that when she walks into a courtroom, normally about two dozen lawyers will file in behind her just to watch her in action. You can do the same. Uh, another thing, some other minor things I want to cover, whenever you sign a legal document, you sign it in blue ink, because if you sign it in black ink, you will not be able to sort out the Xerox copies. And any copy that is signed in blue ink becomes an original. Next thing I want to point out uh, is Ambassador Fox reminded me uh, during one of the breaks is that Blackstone's commentaries were the law book that everybody had prior to our Revolutionary War. In other words, it's a real good summary of the English common law and it's definitely something you should have uh, right after the Rules of Civil Procedure and Black's Law Dictionary. Uh, one of the things I did not cover was discovery. I'm going to come back to that, to that in a minute. Uh, there are other law book publishers besides West Publishing Company. West Publishing is kind of geared towards prosecutors and big business and big government. There are other companies like the Michie Company out of Virginia, M-I-C-H-I-E, uh, Clark Boardman out of New York. There are a number of other law book publishers, and I gotta tell you, some of these law books are literally worth their weight in gold. I bought one set of books uh, by McCarthy, some outfit out of California. Uh, I believe that, um, I'm trying to think of the company that may, might be Matthew Bender that carries it. It's called Bad Faith Insurance, what to do when your insurance carrier stiffs you. And a friend of mine paid $180 for these books, and he read the books, and I coached him through a bad faith case, and he collected $10,000. And then the skinflint was going to send the books back because he didn't need them anymore so he could get a refund. I said, no, I said, I'm not going to allow you to do that. I said, I need these books. I use those books. And thanks to that one set of books, I've had five bad faith insurance companies or bad faith insurance cases that I've walked people through and I have lost zero of them. It's the one type of action when an insurance company stiffs you, the courts have no sympathy for insurance companies. They're really kind of neat outfits to sue because the odds are in your favor. Another thing I want to point out here before I get back to discovery is that, and I, I've said this repeatedly, is that the law is a weapon. Now imagine yourself in 1797, you're on the frontier, uh, and uh, you've got a problem with an Indian war. Well, you have one of two choices. You learn to use the weapons yourself, or you hire mercenaries, because nobody is going to come over free gratis and kill your Indians for you. Next thing is, <clears throat> this is also from Sun Tzu, <coughs> is what is important in warfare is to attack the enemy's strategy. And we've already given you examples of that. If the enemy's strategy is to send motions that you don't know about or to bribe the clerk,